So today we have the pleasure to be uh, in with Sean Binder. Do they spell it right? Yeah, Binder, Binder, as long as you don't call me what they called me in prison, which was Sin Lin Bin. Lin Bin. Okay, can you explain that nickname? I think they just lost. I think the police just lost the last syllable of my name. Okay, so they, you think that they couldn't pronounce it all? I'm not sure, honestly, but most people called me Sin Lin Bin. Sin Lin Bin, okay. So... Yeah. So that's a weird uh, way to start this con this conversation, <laughs> because <laughs> so actually I, I could I could ask you were you imprisoned and then you would say that story. Deal. So were you imprisoned? I was. I spent three and a half months in pre-trial detention on the island of Chios and in jail on the island of Lesbos, where we are right mm -hmm. now. This is like 106 days. Yep, yeah, about that. About that. Okay. So. Um, you came in Mytilene. When was that? I first arrived on the island in 2017 in October. Mm -hmm. And I joined a search and rescue organization called Emergency Response Center International. It's a volunteer organization that had a medical clinic and two search and rescue boats. And what we did was go out to sea and respond to people on the shoreline who are at risk of being in danger mm -hmm. or harmed. Okay, you're Irish, right? I'm German, but I grew up in Ireland okay, at the German. shoreline. Okay, and how did you take the decision to come here and volunteer for the refugee crisis? Well, it was kind of, uh, it grew out of the fact that I had grown up by the beach and had spent a lot of time rescue diving and on boats and swimming. And so I felt I had some skills. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, my academic studies were in European defense and security policy, which is when I realized that the way that Europe responds to one of the most severe humanitarian crises to befall this continent is by securing our borders against people mm -hmm. in distress. And to me, that felt deeply wrong. Um, and so, like many other people, I began to volunteer in search and rescue. Mm -hmm. So you thought that she could be useful in our waters, right? By search and rescue. And what was exactly your field? while you were a volunteer? What were you doing in a normal day? Sure. Um, well, to be honest with you, uh, despite all of these really, I think, exciting and dramatic pictures that search and rescue organizations publicize, more often than not, what I did was quite boring. I <laughs> spent between midnight and 7 a.m. on many nights just standing in one place with a medical backpack looking out to sea and just listening for the sound of boat engines or maybe people screaming or shouting. And in, in which spots exactly? So the island of Lesvos on the southern part of it, on the east, which is where people often tended to make a transition from Turkey to come to seek asylum in mm -hmm. Greece. Uh, and so we would stand by the shoreline and just look and listen. Um, and then we would also do training out on the ships or do response elsewhere along the shoreline around mm -hmm. the sea. Mm -hmm. So you you weren't all day all day long in the sea, actually? No, no, okay. exactly. It's, it's worth noting that um, the organization ran a medical clinic. Mm -hmm. It was one of the only daytime medical clinics in Moria, which was one of the most infamous refugee camps in Europe. And we also had a, a boat crew, but the work was mostly shoreline based. Shoreline based. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this let's say slowly that. Slowly slipping. Yes, <laughs> true. Let's say way. that you found a boat. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was your job exactly? So there are kind of split responsibilities. Um, it depends if the boat is out at sea or if it is at the shoreline. But certainly the priority as soon as a boat arrives is to do triage. The triage is basically just identifying those people who are most at risk. Mm -hmm. and who need the most and most immediate medical care and identifying them and putting them somewhere where they can get that care. Mm -hmm. And for the others who don't need any care or who might need less care, to put those in another location and to deal with them accordingly. Mm -hmm. And in order to do so, you need to first disembark people, so take them off the boat, and then begin sorting everyone out. Mm -hmm. um, I began coordinating the search and rescue, which means that I stood back I watched as things happened and I communicated with the authorities, made sure that everything was happening the way it should. Mm -hmm. And how many years were you in that field? So I volunteered from October 17 
for about 10 months until I was eventually arrested in August 18. Mm -hmm. um, actually, you described your job and that doesn't sound like a crime. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're right. It doesn't sound like a crime. So what I happened? Wonder... Why were you arrested? When were you arrested? What is the evidence? This is a really important question, I think, because when somebody is accused of or indeed charged with being a smuggler, I think the assumption is that that's exactly what we must have done. And when I was first in prison, I agonized over maybe I did do something wrong. Maybe I did something wrong without knowing that mm -hmm. I was doing something wrong. And it pretty quickly became clear to me, because I had a lot of time on my hands in prison, to read through the case file. And the arguments used against us, the things that they say we did, are simply untrue. So for example, for smuggling, they say that I have, on 12 occasions, committed the crime of pulling people across a border. Sorry for interrupting. Can you can you please uh, say the charges first so people will know what you're accused of? Of course. So it is facilitation of illegal entry. Okay. It is being part of a criminal organization. Mm -hmm. Money laundering, mm -hmm. forgery, the illegal use of radio frequencies, and my personal childhood dream come true, spying. Spying? Okay, that's your personal dream and it came to I Greece. think it's pretty cool. Okay, thank us later. So, um, keep going what you were saying. So, I think the first thing to try and address is because the, the main charge is smuggling or facilitating illegal entry. What exactly does that mean? On 12 occasions, I'm supposed to have pulled somebody across mm -hmm. the border from Turkey to, to Greece. The majority of those occasions, I wasn't even in Greece. I had never been to the island. They say, the police say, that I committed the crime of facilitating illegal entry in 2016. I had never been in Greece in 2016. I had simply never been to this country. But there must be something. Okay, like... so you would think so. What about the occasions where I was in Greece? Because, of course, there are occasions where I'm accused of smuggling mm -hmm. or facilitating illegal entry when I am actually in Greece. On those occasions, <clears throat> I remember quite distinctly, I was sitting in front of the the inquisiting judge or the prosecutor, and she said, on this occasion, we can see at 4 a.m., you called, you called 112, and we know that you must have therefore been facilitating illegal entry because you would never call 112 unless you were helping a boat cross. And because you failed to call the authorities, you've committed a crime. Now, this isn't immediately clear what's wrong with that narrative, but... What happened that night? Oh. Okay, yeah, so that night, I, I don't actually recall ex that specific instance, for example. Oh yes, because they, they talked to you about dates that you cannot remember specifically, right? They, it's, it's vague dates, what the, what the point of this story is. So, for example, on that specific night, they have this huge case file, and it's full of all the phone calls that have been made on Lesbos Island between a certain date and a certain date. So from 2016 until 2019 or 2018, for example, there's this huge case file and they go through the whole thing and they find where my number has placed a call. And they say, ah, here on, at 4 a.m. you called 112 and this means that you called because you were helping a boat cross into Greece. But this is just a theory. No, it, 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 hear it out, okay? So they say this is, this is facilitating illegal entry because you didn't call the authorities. What I had to tell the inquisiting judge is that 112 is literally the European emergency response number. It is the number you call to call the authorities. So basically they said to me, the logic is, you called the emergency response number and you failed to call the emergency response number. That is the logic. It, is, it, is, it makes no sense. You know what, I, I can understand your point of view, but don't forget that uh, the, the law in Greece is really strict. For example, all these people who are convicted by being smugglers just because they touched the wheel the moment that their boat was ready to crash on the rocks. Mm -hmm. This doesn't make sense anyway because, mm -hmm. because the law is stupid actually. Well, the interesting thing about that is I, I would reject that. I think the law, the way, yes, Greek laws with regards to what exactly counts as a smuggler is being applied in the most outrageous of ways. But the actual law is pretty clear. 
somebody who claims asylum is exempt from this idea of having crossed a border illegally. Mm -hmm. And that if the individual who's touched a boat engine says they're claiming asylum, they should be treated as such and should be given all the rights associated with it according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a convention which Greece has signed up to. It has existing obligations to ensure that people are not mistreated. Mm -hmm. And so actually the law is pretty clear. The law just happens to be misapplied. Mm -hmm. And I think this is my core point, or our core point is that we're not asking for Greece or the European Union to do something outrageously idealistic or utopian or naive. Mm -hmm. We're simply asking for the authorities to apply their own laws. True. At this point, we should uh, make clear for those who might not know that in Greece, when a new arrival comes to the island or if you spot a boat on emergency, it, you are obligated to call the authorities and inform about this arrival. If you don't, you might face this kind of accusations, uh, which is, of course, not good, but that's the law, and this is why Greek prisons are full of innocent, pe innocent people. And um, let's go on the day that you learn that you have, uh, that there is a warrant for you. <laughs> What happened? Okay. It's like 28th of August or 21? Yeah, exactly. 28th of August. 21st, I think it was. 21st of and August. And it, it wasn't even a warrant of arrest. I mean, we were, I was arrested for the first time in February of 2018. I was arrested at the shoreline at around 2 or 3 a.m. with my colleague Sarah Mardini. We were arrested uh, at the shoreline and it wasn't exactly clear what was wrong. The authorities had arrived, they had said there is something wrong with your Jeep, but weren't being exactly clear what they meant by this. And they asked us to go with them to the police station, which uh, we of course did. The car was your personal car? No, this was the, the organization's, organization's okay. car. And we went with them to the Coast Guard police station, they impounded the car, they searched us, they took our mobile phone devices, we were put in a cell. The following day, I was taken under armed guard to our warehouse and to my home. And at this point it becomes pretty clear that they think I've done something wrong, but they're not exactly sure what it is, because they do a very broad and almost random search of all the boxes in the warehouse. They even end up going through my baking flour to see if I had drugs. And so it became so obvious that the, the forming prosecution was a scattergun attempt at finding something wrong rather than a specific attempt at knowing yes. there was an issue. So they didn't know actually what they were looking for. But they wanted to find something yes. incriminating. Okay. The following day, we were held another night, we were released pending further investigation and we thought this must be a joke i mean there's we've done nothing wrong we've worked together with the authorities with frontex for up to two years at this point as an organization but there was a couple of days later a leak by the police to an online media source and the online media source wrote an article that said something like a german spy which is me and his syrian accomplice which was sarah were arrested in a stolen military jeep trying to infiltrate a naval base to steal state secrets. My first reaction was, that's pretty damn cool. State secrets. Exactly. That's a Hollywood movie. That's what I thought, okay. and I was very impressed with myself. And I thought it was a joke. I thought there can be nothing to this. Again, you know, we helped train the Coast Guard to do search and CPR, for example. I once delivered medical equipment to a Frontex vessel. These are folks that had relied on us. That's crazy that, that the people with. you used to smile to you are now trying to convict you for something that you never did. Yeah, one of the weirdest experiences was I was sitting in a cell that one of those first two nights and one of the officers came over and said, you knew him. we're sorry what's happening, we don't know what's going on. And so when this article came out, we thought, okay, this is clearly very, not serious, but very, dramatic or overblown. We continued to work with the authorities for about six months until eventually we started to get a sense that this article isn't being dramatic. It is exactly what the authorities believe we have done. They believe that we're international spies. And okay, then- a spy for who? 
uh, we'll have to find something. A spy for who? Okay, let's say you are a spy. Who's your boss? They don't know. They don't say. They never make that clear. In fact, the indictment's definition of spying doesn't correspond to the Greek penal code's understanding of what a spy is. Yes, of course, and the law has changed. Those, exactly, there's a complete mismatch. There's a, there's a misunderstanding between the police officer or investigator who wrote this and what the law says. There are two sides to how we are supposed to have spied, two, two acts, I suppose. The first one is that we listened to encrypted communications, and the, the other is that we used encrypted communications. How did you listen? Exactly, good question. They say that we could hear secret communications using special radios. Now, when the Coast Guard themselves were asked by the police to investigate whether these radios could hear encrypted communications, the Coast Guard said, no, it is not. These are off-the-shelf radios. These are the kind of radios that you would expect any boat in the world to have on board. So a fisherman could be a spy, according to their logic. The, pr the issue is, is that the Coast Guard and Frontex communicate on open channels. And so anybody who listens or scans open channels, as a fisherman ought to be doing... Yes, you're obligated to do that. They... So, you know, if a boat is in danger close to your boat, so to inform if you are in danger, it's that's it, actually. This is what we, you should do, fishermen. Don't stop doing that. Exactly. And this is like, and if you know that, then why doesn't the investigating prosecutor know that? Probably because the point is criminalizing humanitarianism. Exactly. This is, I think, the point. Throw as many accusations as you can. The more you throw on, the more defendants you have, the longer it'll take. And this is the point. As soon as you have these really long, really expensive prosecutions, you begin to scare away other people who would engage in search and rescue. And that's exactly what we have seen. Since our arrest today, there is no more civilian search and rescue happening. So they're trying to criminalize humanitarianism and they're trying to send you on a really, I believe, exhausting trial for you because now it's been like four years, mm -hmm. okay? So it all started actually from texts you were sending by via WhatsApp. Exactly, and this is the second part of being a spy, using encrypted communications. What they mean is WhatsApp. What, okay, can you explain me what kind of, of uh, communication was that? That's it able was... to accuse you as a spy? Mm -hmm. So the organization was plugged into a WhatsApp group that contained, I think, up more than 400 people. It was made by the UNHCR, and it was a group in which anybody who was doing anything medical or search and rescue on the southern shore of Lesbos could communicate if they thought there was a boat in distress or if they needed any help. And so any communications into this group about responding to boats in distress, even if it was already on the Lesbos shoreline, the prosecution has taken to be an example of smuggling. An example of, of smuggling. But actually, let's explain that. There is like a group of people, 400 people, who were volunteers. Sure, volunteers, some All professionals, of them. yes. Professionals and volunteers. So there was a communication about boats you learned that they arrive, about what, what refugees need in the camp. What were you talking about in these groups? Yeah, exactly that. It's, for example, a message might say, we think we saw a light um, off the southern shoreline, maybe a kilometer out, can somebody have a look? And it might be a buoy with a light on it. Or can somebody supply us with more emergency blankets? We've run out of ours. Or someone says, I'm going to the camp, I won't be available for a while. It was as banal as that. It is a messaging board or a, a group chat in which people posted information that related to emergency issues at the shoreline. And that's it. And if you happen to post into that at any point, and if the police who looked through my phone thought you were suspicious, your name was to be found in the indictment that we found our names on. I'm not kidding when I say that the prosecution doesn't know some of the names that it has taken from this WhatsApp group. It is completely, seemingly random. It's a random. It's just 
I think in the court today, someone told me, and I think Nassos told me, that it's like shooting with a gun and just wait to see who will be the victim of the bullet. Yeah. Okay, like random shooting. And um, I think that the accusation is that you had information about new arrivals without informing the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. via, and the evidence is via this group in WhatsApp? Yeah, not only that. So when I was saying to you, for example, that they had this big case file of all the phone calls that I ever made, they say, because I didn't call the authorities, I didn't inform the authorities, then I must be a facilitator of illegal entry. But as I told you, on each occasion, we can prove using the police's own evidence that I, in fact, call 112, which is the official number I'm supposed to call. Now, when I said this to the prosecutor, this was the first time that she had realized that 112 was the number in question, was the official number. And you could think at this moment... This is not a knowledge that a prosecutor cannot have. She should have this knowledge. Okay, so you think that maybe there's a mistake then. Maybe she was just... Of course. Maybe she was just mistaken. I don't think that's necessarily true because if you look at, the again, the police's own evidence, about 10 seconds after I placed the 112 call, you can see that my number also calls the local Coast Guard office. And the prosecutor would definitely know what the local Coast Guard office's number is. And so the Coast Guard is saying, I'm a smuggler because I failed to call them. But in their own evidence, you can see that I called them. This, no one is that incompetent. I can say that, okay. So, um, you had the warrant. How were you informed? that you had these accusations. For example, the police came at your house and hand handcuffed you, what happened? Well, we then got, after our initial arrest in February, while we continued working with the authorities, we also had a lawyer. And that lawyer remained in touch with the police just to see if something develops out of this. But this is not the same case, right? It's a different trial. It was not a trial. Oh, it didn't go to a trial. It wasn't a trial. This, it wasn't this a trial. is that trial. Okay. We've had to wait this long for this moment. For this moment. And we continued to work, as I said. But then, in August, the lawyer had more contact with the police, and it was becoming clear that eventually something might happen. And it was around this time that Sarah was Sarah Mardini, my co-accused, was returning to Berlin for her studies. She was returning to university, and she was boarding a flight to go to Athens when plainclothes police officers surrounded her and said, "Hang on, Sarah, we have a few more questions for you. Won't you come back to the police station with us?" And she said, "Of course." And so she was sitting in a police station when I got a call saying, it was maybe 7 a.m., Sean, you have to come in as well. They have some questions for both of us. I arrived at the police station and I sat down and they had no questions for us. And after a couple of hours, I said, look, I need to go to work. I was going to spend the day in Moria camp in the clinic. I need to go and do that. And they said, no, you're going nowhere. Put out your hands. Sarah and I put out our hands and they handcuffed us together and they took us to the courthouse where we were today. And we were at that moment formally charged with very, very serious crimes and accused of even more serious crimes that I've already listed to you. And because they're so serious, it was decided that we would be held in pretrial detention for, as you know, over 100 days. Okay. So, um, and the, the other guys, I think there were three people imprisoned as well? Yeah, we were five in total. You were five in total. Okay, and uh, what was your first reaction when you realized that you are actually in jail? <laughs> um, I wasn't particularly happy about it. I think it was such a... <laughs> I bet you weren't. <laughs> it was a... What frustrated me hugely was the hypocrisy of the situation. The European Union spends a lot of its time talking about how important human rights are and the rule of law is around the world. And yet, as soon as we are expected to do the same thing internally, for example, in the Mediterranean or in the GNC, we forget about it. And so it was incredibly frustrating, and I was very angry that I would be arrested for doing what I believed and what I know the law demands we do. It is interesting to know that when I was in prison, every inmate always says, I'm not guilty, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, yes. that was my cousin's car, 
I didn't mean to punch this person. But when they heard of our case, they were like, yeah, but you really aren't. You, you are innocent. And I think on the one hand, that's fortifying because I know I've done nothing wrong. At the same time, it deeply damages your confidence in the judicial system, in so-called European values, when this can happen. Of course, you're an inmate for something that you never did, actually. Mm. And I can't imagine the, 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 the psychological effect that this might has left to you. Yes, um, I think that, I mean, I've been very lucky. I have, you know, I sometimes have, you know, anxious moments mm -hmm. and if I'm probably more angry than I used to be. Um, but at the same time, I've been really supported. I have enjoyed so much support from friends and family, from excellent lawyers, from the media, international media, from human rights organizations. And so to some extent, I felt a little bit, or I do feel a little bit of guilt, or at least I reflect on the fact that even in criminalization, even in solidarity around criminalization, inequalities reproduce themselves. I had excellent lawyers. I spent time in a prison with refugees who were accused of being smugglers, who never ever were offered a lawyer, who've never been communicated with in a way that remotely resembles justice or even fairness. And so it's so important, I think, to reflect on that. Even if I feel angry or upset, I shouldn't feel too sorry for myself. And we should all remember that you know, I There's am always much worse. So many more cases that are infinitely worse than mine. Okay. And if your crime is just being a human being with solidarity and humanitarianism, I guess you would do that again, right? Of course. Always. I mean Have you ever have, have you ever thought that uh, my choice has destroyed my life. Probably I shouldn't have come here and try to rescue people. Maybe I should stay back in my home country. Don't be involved. Have you ever thought of all that? And it's not bad if you have. Actually, you are a human being. You see someone lying on the ground and they're hurt. What do you do? You help. Exactly. One would always do that. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that it happens at the border. People still deserve to live. That's, that's the core point. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are. You have a human right to life. And we have to preserve that. And if the authorities aren't doing that, then somebody else has to. In the ideal world, there would be no need for search and rescue because no one is drowning. In a better world, the authorities would do search and rescue. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, in the world that we live in, they don't do that. And they don't respect human rights. And they don't respect the law. Mm -hmm. And so someone has to do it. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, yes, I flew the entire way from one side of Europe to the other to volunteer in Greece. But I did that because I know that the Greek border is also a European border. And what happens at the European border like when we abandon people to die, happens in my name. Policies are imposed at Europe's borders because they think European citizens want that, and I do not. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it is important for me and all other EU citizens to stand up and say, no, 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 no. We must follow the law, we must follow our values, and we must do what is right. Even if we don't like the people that we're helping, that makes no difference. Mm -hmm. And what happens when the law criminalizes putting a blanket on a refugee before you call the police. It doesn't. It doesn't. That is, that is not what the law says. This is what judges say that the law says. They are misinformed. How For example, do you remember the case of a refugee who gave water and food to, I think in Hios, to uh, new arrivals and he he was in the court and he, he, he would be imprisoned, but thank God the judges were logic. And he, he had the same accusations as you. 
because he was informed that, you know what, some people are in need. And the first thing he thought is like, okay, I was in the same need six months ago. Mm -hmm. So let's go and give them some food, some water and blankets. Mm -hmm. And actually what, they, what that guy did, while he was walking on the supermarket, two police officers stopped him. Face control, of course, mm -hmm. identity profiling. So he asked, where are you going? And he said, I'm, some new arrivals are here, so I'm going to grab some water. And he, the police officers were like, new arrivals? He was so... It, he, he confessed, so he was innocent, of course, because he told the police officer, so they went together. He gave the water, he gave the, the food, and he was arrested mm -hmm. with the same accusations like you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, what, what, what can we do to change this situation? Because in the name of democracy, we criminalize solidarity. Yeah, it's funny that, isn't it? I hear this so often, people who disagree with my worldview, they often say, Sean, we cannot open our borders, we cannot help people coming from outside of Europe because it will, they threaten democracy. My thinking is that as soon as you decide to abandon those people to drown, you've already lost democracy. Democracy is about helping people, democracy is about justice and fairness. So if you really want to protect them, then live them, then put them into practice. I think your question is an important one, and it's frightening to think that the direction of travel across Europe, whether it's the rise of the right in Italy or in Sweden or around Europe, is a bad direction of travel, and it looks like things are getting worse. I think we're getting polarized around a lot of these topics where I find my confidence to challenge, to fight for my cause and others, is that I remember that the law is on our side. The Universal Declaration is on our side. The European Convention on Human Rights is on our side. Every single maritime convention is on our side. The Facilitation Directive is on our side. Domestic Greek law is actually on our side. It just needs to be applied properly. So you believe that in the end of that game, you will be actually innocent. It is not illegal to help people at risk of drowning. There is no law that says that. Okay. And if there ever is, that will be the darkest day for democracy. True. Um, and I want to, I, I forgot that I wanted to make a question before. You, one of your accusations is about like, giving or receiving one 120,000 euros like and that they, they, they took that back what happened I have honestly no idea what this is referring to except for the fact that it might be the um, the money laundering charge the, yes the money laundering they they were talking about one 120,000. Uh, euros being laundered, and what is that? Yeah, again, How did it come out? I cannot tell you. I have no idea. I think NASA might have more information on that. It was, um, it was an example given of I think of money laundering. Now, one I have as a volunteer no access to the organization's okay, account. What I see today is a person who doesn't know for what he is accused for, and this is what the lawyers said today in the court. My clients do not know what they are accused for. That's because it is almost impossible to understand most of what the charges actually relate to. I mean, we don't have an indictment with us now, but it is just really poorly written. It's it, poorly written. It doesn't correct. make sense. Many, many mistakes as well. It is literally missing a page. Okay. It is how, missing how, a page. How can that be the case? How can... How can a genuine prosecution write an indictment that is missing a page? It, it would almost be a joke if people's lives weren't on the line. Mm -hmm. What's the plans for, 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 for the rest of your life? Will you keep being a humanitarian here in Mytilini or will you go back to Europe? No, I, I, not at all. I think, you know, it's, I never intended to be um, 
a humanitarian or human rights activist. I, I wanted to volunteer for a few months to help people because I thought I could and I thought I could help. You know, I had every intention of working as a normal person and, you know, living my life, starting a family, growing old. And so far, all I've managed to do is grow old. Everything else has been put on hold. I think that's what's so frustrating as well is that we tend to view activism and humanitarianism as something that other people do because we often view it as being these really big acts. For example, going out to sea to do search and rescue. But actually, activism and human rights are practiced at the, at the very small level. If there is a meal in your fridge and you know your neighbor is hungry, then giving them that meal is a form of activism and humanitarianism. And I think it's important that we reframe what it is to help others as being a normal part of everyday life rather than something that happens among other people over there. Do you think they achieved their goal though? For example, have you noticed if the volunteers and the activists are less active because they're afraid for their lives? That's a fact, yeah. So well, not for their lives necessarily, that. but certainly for their freedom. Um, we have seen that the day after our arrest, there was no more search and rescue on the southern part of the island. Today, there's no more search and rescue at all. Our case is one of at least 50 cases in at least 14 EU member states that relate to only one EU directive. So that doesn't even capture data for other laws across other member states or even non-judicial intimidation and harassment, which also has a chilling effect on search and rescue and humanitarian action. So it's very frightening indeed. It is frightening. Um, because, because you know what, this is like, this is amazing that they're trying to achieve stopping people from being humanitarians and they actually achieve it. Because when you are an activist and you know that another activist is convicted with so many, so many accusations for nothing, then you will not approach a boat. Sure. And that's exactly. logic. You're afraid for your own freedom. And I have heard that there are people, between these 20 and 24 people, there are people who don't know that they are accused because they have never found them. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, there are names on, in the indictment that we have never heard of, that the prosecution has never heard of. These are names simply taken from a WhatsApp conversation from five years ago. So, of course, we are in 2023. Of course, they can find them and inform them. You would think so. Especially if they thought that they were actually international criminals. Yes, but if, if, they, if they are actually convicted, then they will know that they are convicted when they will travel for vacation. Because someone will stop them and say, you know what? It almost seems like it's unjust. It almost seems like it is a complete injustice, this entire process, doesn't it? Yes, <laughs> I think so. So, uh, do you have anything else to add? Um, I'm not sure. I think we covered a lot of ground there. Um, I think NASA's probably will have a few things to add. Mm -hmm. He's going to be great. It's going to be great. So. Uh, we are really glad that you that we met you and I hope that all this will finally go to an end and you will be actually a free man, you and all the other 23. And I think that your case must be heard to the end of the world if that exists because it's, it's a proof that in the name of democracy you do the actions that are actually actions of dictatorship. <laughs> and this is why we all believe that you guys who are heroes, because you save lives, deserve not your freedom, because this, this it's not like, we will not discuss about freedom, Every, everyone deserves freedom, but at least to thank you. I don't know about but that. to keep you in jail. I, I don't think it's... You, you used the word hero, for example. I, I reject that. I think that um, no one should ever be thanked for doing what we expect. I mean, 
I, I think we should all be okay expecting that no one drowns. I think that is a, a, bin, a minimum. Um, something that people often say is two things. Either they say, I'm, I'm a criminal, what I did was terrible and I should be imprisoned. Or people who are incredibly kind and lovely say, you're a hero, what you did was is to be celebrated. And I, I actually think that they're both problematic for the same reasons, because it, whether something is criminal or heroic, it implies that, it's, that helping people is not normal. Mm -hmm. When you say that helping people is either criminal or heroic, you're saying that it's not normal. And the point, of course, is that helping somebody in distress is absolutely normal. And so it doesn't need to be praised or thanked. It is normal, but we live in a country where the government's policy is not to help people. Sure. And this is why we should lighten people who do that. So thank you so much about that interview. Thank I hope you. everything is going to be okay and we will be glad to host you again. Thank you. I look forward to it.